Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming to the ITU UNICEF Open Forum. Uh, there was an amazing discussion going on on sleep patterns. I hope that ours is equally interesting. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so we have a great panel here today, and uh, we hope that the audience is uh, very interactive because uh, the primary reason for this uh, uh, open forum is, is to get your views on uh, uh, the industry guidelines that we have been working on uh, uh, through our COP partners for uh, at least a few months now. So we are looking for your feedback. We've also posted it online, so your feedback. Uh, UNICEF, AIA from UNICEF will be telling you more about it. So uh, let me quickly introduce the panel. Uh, I'm Pritam Malur from the ITU, uh, General Secretariat. And uh, AIA uh, Hetavu from uh, UNICEF. I hope I got the last name. Uh, Dominic Lezinski from uh, GSMA. Uh, Susan Hargreaves uh, from the Internet Watch Foundation, John Carr, UNESCO, uh, Giacomo Mazzoni, who's sitting there from the European Broadcasting uh, Union, and Kim Sanchez from Microsoft. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. OK. And, uh, I was supposed to start the presentation, which is now. So uh, my colleague Carla uh, was to be here, and uh, unfortunately, she couldn't. So she's asked me to do the presentation. But I realize that uh, uh, we our focus is on the guidelines. So I'll just very, very quickly run you through the presentation. It's, it's on the uh, ITU Child Online Protection Initiative, under which uh, uh, we are uh, revising the guidelines. So quickly, ITU and cybersecurity, we've been working on this area for quite some time. In 2005, uh, the World Summit on Information Society uh, is where we got the mandate for uh, acting as a facilitator for uh, security. In 2007, the ITU Secretary General la launched the Global Cybersecurity Agenda, which is a framework for cooperation, under which we launched two many initiatives, but two big ones, which are the impact an early warning system assisting countries for uh, establishing their certs and uh, several other uh, uh, actions, and uh, the Child Online Protection Initiative. I'm going to go through this very, very quickly. Uh, five minutes is all I'm going to take. <clears throat> so the Global Cybersecurity Agenda, again, a framework for international cooperation, it, it tries to look at a holistic approach. So it has five pillars, legal measures, one of which... Uh, is harmonizing uh, 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 national laws, uh, technical and procedural measures, including standardization and all that. Operational structure, which is uh, helping countries uh, establish institutional frameworks, capacity building, training awareness, and international cooperation frameworks. <clears throat> Child Online Protection Initiative, uh, of course, uh, launched in 2008 under the GCA. Uh, we're trying to bring together uh, stakeholders from across the board, from all stakeholder groups. And uh, the key objectives, identifying risks, creating awareness, developing practical tools uh, to help governments, uh, educators, parents, uh, sharing knowledge and experience. We have uh, partners from across the board uh, under the initiative. Uh, International organizations, uh, UNICEF, of course, uh, UNODC, UNICRI, uh, ENISA, many. Uh, civil society, of course, uh, is one of the most valuable partners, uh, and we're grateful for the support we get. <coughs> Private sector, uh, you'll see that many of them are here uh, supporting us, uh, working on the guidelines, Microsoft, GSMA. And uh, we have, uh, uh, well, uh, AI is laughing because we had a discussion on this. But we, we have uh, uh, our patrons, our patrons are global champions, people who are really motivated uh, 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 to support us and people with global reach. So we have uh, the president of Costa Rica, who has been a very ardent supporter of uh, the initiative. Uh, we have Ms. Deborah Taylor Tate, uh, the former FCC commissioner. We have uh, Her Excellency Dame uh, Patience Goodluck uh, Jonathan, the first lady of Nigeria, who was recently appointed as the, uh, the child online protection champion in, uh, uh, for the Africa region. 
now the guidelines. Uh, so the first set of guidelines was developed in 2009, uh, again, uh, working with our partners. Uh, and uh, these guidelines are, uh, uh, you can find them on the uh, ITU website. Uh, we had guidelines for uh, children, parents, and educators, industry, and governments, I think. Uh, so this was 2009. And uh, we realized uh, the world has moved on since then, so it's time to update the guidelines. So the first guidelines that we decided to update was the uh, guidelines for industry. Um, the recommendation for this came through our working group, uh, which is a group of membership uh, at ITU membership, and uh, it's open to all stakeholder groups. And uh, so we constituted an uh, author's working group. And uh, we are grateful to UNICEF here for taking the lead in uh, the uh, in in in, uh, in the guidelines, uh, the taking overall uh, charge of the editorship of the guidelines. And of course, uh, we've gone through the process of revising it. A, a few drafts. Uh, we have a stable draft, but we really need uh, input from uh, all stakeholder groups, and uh, we are doing it by us going to different forums where we can meet uh, our stakeholders and also putting it online so that uh, we get feedback from the widest possible uh, audience. Uh, some other activities, uh, uh, national surveys, uh, COP statistical frameworks and indicators in 2010 work we did. We are developing case studies with countries. We are co collecting country profiles uh, for uh, uh, what countries are doing uh, on child online protection. So we prepared a draft. We presented it to the recent working group meeting in October. And we, what we are trying to do now is to get the countries to validate it so that we can post it online. It gives you the focal point for a particular country for child online protection. Uh, it, it gives you the various uh, legislative measures that a country has implemented and uh, other initiatives that uh, the country has done. So it's a valuable resource, and I encourage you to uh, make use of it or contribute to it. <clears throat> National strategy framework. This is one of the uh, uh, big focus areas, helping countries devise a national uh, strategy framework so that uh, you have a more harmonized approach in countries to, uh, to uh, the issue uh, because you need your uh, law enforcement agencies to work with your hotline. Uh, you need your uh, civil society members to work with the government, and you need uh, like a, you need the different government agencies to work together. So you need a national strategy framework, especially in developing countries. So we are working with uh, countries to uh, help them establish this. Uh, some of the recent ones we've uh, worked with are Nigeria, Cameroon, Mauritius, Gambia, Ghana, Sierra Leone. So uh, we are quite active in this, and we are looking to your support. We uh, have just started a project in uh, Ethiopia uh, with uh, uh, an organization called Ecopia and Facebook. Uh, it's a six-month project, uh, and uh, primarily on uh, building uh, e-safety awareness in uh, schools. We recently had a big uh, uh, global youth forum, uh, which uh, many of you have participated and contributed towards. And uh, in which we had the Be Smart, Be Safe track, which was primarily on child online protection. We are thankful to UNICEF and the Walt Disney Company for uh, their active uh, participation, support, and leading the organization of this. Uh, we had the train the trainer program, uh, uh, and we also had a global video competition there. The, we, we have put everything online, so it, it's, it, you would be very interested in going to the ITU website and looking at this. We have our um, working group on child online protection. It's, it's, uh, it's one of the more formal groups within ITU, but of course, uh, with, with considering the topic, it's, it's the discussions are quite informal in nature, uh, quite uh, intense and quite interactive. And uh, it's a place where uh, uh, the 193 countries, uh, the focal points, plus industry, plus civil society, academia, everyone can come and discuss. Uh, talk about public policy issues, technical issues, uh, capacity building, training and awareness initiatives, and uh, come out with good solutions that we can implement. 
uh, some upcoming events. Uh, I know that many are, uh, I spoke to at least a few yesterday who are going to Oman uh, uh, for this particular workshop. ITU Telecom is one which is coming up where uh, we, we are planning to have a child online protection uh, component. Uh, we are organizing a World Cafe at a cybersecurity conference in uh, Azerbaijan, Baku, 2nd, 3rd of December. Uh, and then we have the uh, we are planning an ACOP uh, African uh, Child Online Protection Summit in uh, February. Some other planned activities, as I said, the uh, Council Working Group uh, uh, is a very active group where we discuss these and come up with thoughts on how to help uh, uh, countries. And uh, these are some of the initiatives. And again, I invite you to contribute to these. That's it. Thank you very much. And I'll pass on the uh, floor to Aya. Thanks. Thank you very much. Maybe you can help me with the slides as you have <laughs> access to them. Just uh, before, uh, before starting, uh, really, I'd like to mention a few words um, about um, UNICEF and, and why we're actually so why, why did we volunteer to, to take a lead in, in editing these guidelines? And, and part of the explanation is actually um, uh, in, in basically um, in, in the structure of UNICEF because uh, actually uh, the team that has been most involved in, in this initiative um, where I'm also part of is the Corporate Social Responsibility Unit of uh, UNICEF, uh, which is a fairly new unit uh, within UNICEF. Uh, and our primary um, mandate is to engage with the private sector on issues related to children's rights and business. Um, I don't know if you are familiar with the, the principles um, related to business and children's rights, which were uh, introduced last year. Uh, so that's the framework within which we operate and engage with the, the private sector through the, either directly or through different kind of uh, platforms. And we also engage with the governments on the children's rights and business agenda. Uh, and we now have a general comment number 16 for the Convention of the Rights of the Child, which specifically looks at the issues of business and children's rights. So we had a kind of a, um, a good reason uh, to get very engaged. Uh, and obviously UNICEF has been part of the COP platform for quite a while. But the main participants have been uh, more from um, uh, the programmatic side of uh, UNICEF from the Child Protection uh, Unit. So that's just as a background, and we're really excited about the guidelines, and we really hope that um, this uh, broader consultation uh, beyond just the group of, uh, of uh, the members of uh, the, the COP initiative is, is going to interest people and, and that we're going to get lots of feedback and also commitment uh, for the, the guidelines. So let's, um, let's uh, have a look at the slides. <laughs> it's wonderful to have uh, a male, male support staff here helping with the slides. So, uh, just, uh, so I'm, I'm very happy to be able to, to be here today to introduce you to the guidelines. Um, and, and basically, I'm, I'm going to explain a bit about the background and the development of the guidelines, and then uh, give you the, the kind of uh, overall concept of what the guidelines look like uh, today and then uh, speak about the general part of the guidelines. And I have uh, our, our colleagues here uh, who are going to speak about the specific parts which are uh, for the different subsectors of, uh, of the ICT industry. So uh, let's start with the, with the background. Thank you. Uh, I think this is, is like a bit of repetition probably from, uh, from, uh, from my colleague from ITU, but I think one of the, the key things when, when we started uh, uh, working with the ICT industry uh, two years ago, basically when the, the unit was set up, was, was the challenges that there's lots of guidance available left, right, and center, but at the same time technology is moving fast forward, and there's also a lot of things happening in the regulation area. So when you look at the convergence uh, uh, of, of uh, what happens with technology and all these issues and the guidelines around there, it's very difficult to sort of uh, stay on track. And obviously, uh, normally the way the UN organizations work is that we all have our little silos and we start working on, on uh, our own guidance for whatever we, we see fit. Uh, but so we, as being part of the COP initiative, we thought that this would be a great uh, Opportunity to work together with industry experts and our colleagues at um, at the uh, at the UN uh, to actually uh, uh, start putting together a framework uh, which would be more meaningful than the existing uh, guidelines that that uh, were there from five years ago. So that's a bit of the background. The other other thing which was kind of a key trigger, uh, if you if you can 
have the next slide, please, is, is also uh, the, the kind of uh, broadening discussion about children's rights. So it's not only about uh, children's rights in terms of the, the protection of children, uh, but it is, uh, it is much broader as a discussion. And so there is a very strong uh, participation element uh, when it comes to children's rights in the, in the virtual world, which also needs to be brought into, into the framework of, of how the private sector should engage in this area. If you... So more specifically on child online protection, I think uh, the audience is, is well, well aware of the number of initiatives and, and, um, and challenges uh, with the legislation and the global nature of, of the issues. Uh, uh, also, some of the, you know, where UNICEF comes from, uh, very much thinking that, you know, this is a, um, you know, whatever happens in the real world should be able to, to be possible in the, in the online world and, and the parents and the educators role, uh, being very important. It is much more challenging in the online world. So, lots of, uh, issues and challenges and, and all these, uh, were kind of the discussions behind the, the revision and, and the work that we started uh, um, or commenced uh, on the revision of, of the, the guidelines. So um, <clears throat> some of the key topics uh, uh, that were being discussed, and, and some of them came through in the, in the previous guidelines already, but more specifically kind of highlighting the, the core uh, risks uh, uh, when it comes to child rights, obvious obvious topic being uh, child sexual abuse. So this is the word we we at the UN prefer to use as as opposed to child pornography, which has a bit of a different um, um, kind of a tone to it uh, with the kind of consent element. Uh, but then it's it's all about the content. It's about conduct. It's about contact. Uh, and and the the raising discussion is is really about the ICT value chain and and how do you define it? How broad do you do you see it as to be? So if you look at the value chain and you start adding uh, all these um, additional services, not only in terms of applications or content, but also e-commerce services, etc. Um, so how how broad can the the area of responsibility and 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 uh, and kind of uh, activity in terms of child protection uh, be. So what, what came through from these discussions uh, was, was um, an element not only looking at, at the protection element, but also the importance of, of um, the ICT industry as a, as a driver for, uh, for, uh, for children's rights and, and how the participation element of children's rights could be incorporated. And here are some of the the kind of topics uh, related to that. Um, I'm not going to <laughs> repeat it all, uh, but maybe the next slide. So that's really the, the background for the development and, and the, the start of the discussion. And, and uh, I think it's been a very fruitful process. And, and here you see the, the number uh, of uh, institutions who have been part of, um, part of the, the discussions and contri contributed uh, and basically formed the, the new framework uh, for, this, um, for this guidance. Um, I think uh, it's um, looking back at the, the original uh, guidance documents, I think there were challenges on, on, on the fact that, um, uh, especially uh, when you look at the, the COP uh, membership structure, the private sector is not very well presented there. So uh, um, having the opportunity now to have a broader consultation on the guidelines and, and specifically looking at the, the subsectors of the, the ICT industry is going to be absolutely relevant to, to uh, really, um, really um, nail down the, the detail and, and, and gain the agreement from, uh, from the industry on these issues. So what is happening now is uh, that basically the, the current draft of the guidelines uh, is, uh, is available. Um, it's uh, just been posted on the businessandhumanrights.org uh, website for, uh, for consultation, which, is, uh, which we're kind of announcing here right now. Uh, so as you see the IGF uh, logo on the, on the, um, on, underneath. And, and basically, um, uh, during the course of uh, the next, uh, roughly next month, um, we are looking forward to getting, uh, getting feedback on the guidelines. So uh, the guidelines are there, and there's also a kind of a questionnaire which, uh, which provides you um, kind of a framework for, for uh, providing input. And if you have any queries, um, both, uh, both ITU and uh, UNICEF are available for any, any consultation. There's going to be another uh, uh, kind of a presentation about this uh, at the ITU Telecom World uh, 13 uh, in Bangkok. So what are the guidelines then? So as I mentioned, there was a lot of discussion about how to structure uh, the, the new set of guidelines in, in a framework which 
sort of respects the, the advances in technology, the convergence of the challenges, and, but also the regulatory framework. So one of the aims of, of the guidelines is uh, to set the scene really quite strongly within the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights framework and, and as how they were introduced. And that comes through especially in the, in the first section, which talks about the policies, policies and management processes. So not to look at just child online protection in isolation of, of everything, but to really um, frame it within the, the other uh, uh, rights-related uh, uh, um, processes and, and policies that the company has. The second section is, is looking at the, um, specifically on the child sexual abuse content. Uh, then uh, the, the third uh, uh, section uh, of the general guidelines is looking at the safe uh, and age-appropriate environment. Very much the, the um, content, the, the contact um, as well as uh, the conduct uh, elements uh, and, and how to make sure that the, the private sector can uh, provide a, an, an environment uh, which is as safe as it, it can be. Uh, then the fourth section is about uh, more about the advancing children's rights uh, in the online space, about um, uh, uh, through uh, the, the children uh, themselves, parents and teachers who are key elements in this. And then uh, finally, it's, it's about the positive use of the, the technology to, um, to further good citizenship. So these are the, the core uh, elements, and I'll, I'll drill a bit more in detail into the different sections. But just to um, repeat um, uh, in terms of the, the, what the aim of the framework really is, it is to have a kind of a broad uh, accepted framework, which obviously is it's going to be a generic framework uh, which will need to be taken into the national context when it comes to legislation, etc. But what we're really seeking to have is, is, um, is the private sector participation in this initiative to uh, be part of uh, and take leadership in, in this initiative. So when we looked at the different uh, industry uh, participants, if you just move back, uh, obviously uh, it depends how you want to define the ICT value chain. You know, you can go as broad as, as you like. But these were the kind of industry subsectors that we, we started looking at and which then formed the part uh, uh, which is uh, now the subsector-specific guidance um, if you look at the next uh, uh, element. So we have six uh, specific checklists for the subsectors uh, within the framework. So that really is, is the structure of, of the guidelines. And, <laughs> and more specifically, uh, I already mentioned the policies and the management processes section. Uh, that really ties into the broader framework of, uh, of corporate responsibility within the organizations and how the, the child rights element as well as the, the overall child online protection uh, fits into that. And the way the UN guiding principles uh, call upon uh, the private sector, it really is about the policy uh, development. It is about the due diligence to identify the impacts uh, within the, the operations uh, by cons consultation of stakeholders, including young people, and then go through the, the, um, the, the, the due diligence process to uh, also report and be transparent about the issues and how they are being tackled. So the, the next uh, element about the child sexual abuse content, that's very much uh, the, the legal compliance-driven framework. Uh, uh, and there's um, you know, uh, references to, to terms and conditions, to, uh, to notice and take down processes. And really, uh, really the, the core is, is to work with the national law enforcement and, and national hotlines. Then <clears throat> the core um, kind of, um, let's say, uh, online environment related uh, part of, of the, the top line uh, general guidelines is, is about the, the provision or, or the implementation of technical measures that are needed depending on the, on the subsector of, um, of the ICT industry that, that you operate in to make sure that there is this framework in place as good as it gets um, and communicating uh, this very clearly and also uh, using the, the age uh, verifications and, and the, the um, uh, age uh, classification systems uh, where, where those exist or, or try to push forward uh, initiatives to, to define those and, and make them uh, standards. Um, about parents, uh, caregivers, and, and teachers, obviously they, they bear their responsibility when it comes to uh, uh, children's uh, 
children's um, online uh, protection or, or participation as well. And so there's um, an invitation to, to really to, to look at this area and also uh, provide uh, technical solutions uh, for those uh, um, who, who are engaged uh, in, in children's well-being and educational activities. And then the last section is, is really uh, looking at the broader um, broader children's rights elements and in terms of supporting the participation elements, uh, protecting the freedom of expression of all users uh, and promoting uh, the, the good uh, practices uh, for advancing children's rights on, um, on, on the, the online world. So that's a very quick uh, introduction to the, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it ended up being a very quick one, but in any case, it was an introduction to the general part of the guidelines. And now I pass on the microphone to hear more about the, the sector-specific um, uh, elements. Hello, um, Fiona McIntosh from the Alana and Madeline Foundation in Australia. Thank you for um, welcoming our input into um, these guiding principles. I've just been searching that site while we're online and it's quite difficult to find. Do you have any further guidance? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. It's, uh, I got a message like while we were starting that it's, it's online, so I don't have the URL yet either. So I'll, I'll provide that by the end of uh, this session. <laughs> Terrific, thank you. Uh, but just to add to that, uh, we will be posting the, I mean, we'll be giving a direct link to the uh, site from the ITU page and also the UNICEF page. So it's all work in progress. Probably by the end of the day, everything should be set. Uh, just to uh, maybe the order in which uh, we can present the guidelines is uh, Dominique, uh, followed by Susie, John, Giacomo, Kim, and then uh, if, ah, Anjan. Okay, thanks. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm Dominique Luzanski from the GSMA, from everyone who's come in a bit late. Uh, thanks for the overview. Uh, that was a very thorough and in-depth overview. And I, um, I'm going to touch briefly on the mobile operators and the checklist that uh, was discussed within, within the opening. And uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time because I'd rather have more time for discussion and questions. Um, the GSMA does an, a number of different things. Uh, in this area, and unfortunately, my colleague Jenny, who uh, is participated quite closely and, and wrote the guidelines um, in conjunction with uh, UNICEF, couldn't make it today, so I'm filling in for her. So I'll try to be um, answer your questions as well. But one of the things we undertake at the GSMA is the Mobile Alliance Against Child Sexual Abuse Content, um, and and that's one of the many sort of participatory participatory groups that um, we're involved in, including. Uh, you know, a number of working groups as well with the ITU. So in terms of the checklist, when you have the URL, you'll see that uh, mobile operators have a particular section. And um, again, I'm going to touch briefly on it. But, but a couple of things that we uh, promote is the fact that um, there's a world of opportunity for youth right now. And, and actually, a number of you have received our most recent survey. And I, I have... Um, some shorter versions later, if you want to come up and take a, a bit of a pampl pamphlet. We survey a number of countries um, to look at children online and, and their activities. So we realize that there's, especially in the mobile industry, a lot going on. We also believe in self-regulation and um, cooperation in that self-regulation, especially with a, um, a number of groups, including In Hope, which was mentioned. So our checklist includes... Um, Issues like we believe uh, we need to integrate child rights into all um, corporate policies and management processes. And again, you'll have more details when you see the uh, when you see the report. We also have uh, developed standard processes for uh, cooperation with businesses, um, with law enforcement, and we collaborate uh, to create hotlines if there aren't any hotlines, as well as to work in conjunction with hotlines and to provide training. Um, we also have mechanisms, we recommend mechanisms within the organization to report illegal content and, again, to cooperate to work with investigations. Uh, the other thing is it's important to be very clear as a mobile operator around the terms of service and terms of condition and what will or will not be tolerated and how that, um, that 
that mechanism for reporting content when consumers see that and, and how that works as well. Um, and we have a process, we recommend a process for the mobile industry in terms of notice and takedown as well and coming up with guidelines and uh, information relating to the content and how that particularly works. Uh, in terms of interacting with consumers a bit more, I'll touch upon that. Um, we should be developing, mobile operators should be developing clear house rules, what is acceptable and not acceptable in terms of what is legal and illegal, but not only that, but what is acceptable in the terms of service, including what content would be banned, uh, as well as you know things like swearing and, and bullying. Nothing particularly new, but we just go through that and highlight these particular issues. And what will... Um, what will uh, constitute a breach of terms as well as um, a suspension of service. The important thing around all of this, uh, as I mentioned probably briefly, is to be transparent and to um, be very clear and communicate all of this to both the consumers as well as internally to the, to the people that are uh, working at the mobile operators. Um, and finally, just briefly, um, Mobile operators should uh, complement technical measures with education and empowerment as well as enforcement. And these activities, again, nothing particularly earth-shattering, but just reminding that these activities are important in terms of, um, you know, educating both parents and children about what they can do and what, what is, you know, good and bad behavior as well as what is legal and illegal on, on online and what services um, are age-restricted or appropriate as well as um, how to be safe and responsible online. So I'm going to stop there because I'm sure that all of you have similar guidelines and you can add to this as well. But if you have any questions, please let me know after. Who's next? Thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here on behalf of, of the Internet Watch Foundation. Uh, we are the UK hotline for reporting criminal content. And uh, we're very proud to be partners in the COP initiative. I have a two-minute film to, sh to show to you, if the sound works, um, which just explains what the IWF is. And the reason I'm showing this is because this is the approach that we're taking with the ITU in the countrywide uh, templates that we've, um, we've created. So we'll give it a go. When a child is sexually abused, it affects them for life. And when they are filmed or photographed being sexually abused, it leaves them exploited by those who seek their images. By reporting these images, you can help stop this exploitation. At the Internet Watch Foundation, we work with the online industry to eliminate images of child sexual abuse from the Internet. Each year we receive thousands of reports to our hotline. But we need your help. If you see something online which you think violates the laws on child sexual abuse, it's important to report it to the IWF. Your report will be treated confidentially, but you can choose to leave your details if you'd like to know the outcome of your report. Our highly trained analysts will assess the images and videos you report against UK law. And if we find it to be potentially criminal, we will take steps to ensure it is removed. For UK-based web pages, the Internet Watch Foundation works with the police to confirm we can take action. The UK host, or ISP, will then be notified to remove the content, and they do this typically within 60 minutes. If it's hosted abroad, we work with other hotlines through InHope the Association of Internet Hotlines, to take action. If it's hosted in a country with no InHope hotline, the IWF works directly with international partners. While the content is awaiting removal, the web page address is added onto the IWF URL list. This is voluntarily used by the online industry to ensure their users can't accidentally see it. Sometimes our analysts see the sexual abuse of a child they don't recognize. When this happens, we take further action to find the source of the image. We then notify the relevant police body. 
Our efforts result in success stories of children rescued from their abusers. With the collaboration of the IWF, the wider internet industry and police, the UK is now a hostile place to host child sexual abuse content. It's our vision to achieve this worldwide and eliminate online child sexual abuse content for good. The continuing support of the online industry, government, police, other partners, and of course the public, makes this an ever achievable goal. Together, we can make a difference. Um, right, thank you very much. The, um, the reason I showed you that is that we very much advocate a, a multi-stakeholder partnership approach in the removal of online child sexual abuse content. And we came into working with the ITU, we were delighted to be partners with them, um, where we looked at ways in which we could do this in other countries. So we have worked to develop a countrywide assessment template for countries without a hotline, where we can go into those countries and we can bring all of those stakeholders together. Now we were in Cameroon, uh, I was in Cameroon with Jenny Jones from GSMA, and with Carla from the ITU, and we ran a, a joint workshop with the six African countries that were mentioned before. Um, the, the point of this is that the, then we can assess what their needs are. We can work from the ITU um, country, country assessment, which covers the whole issue of child online protection. And then we can use that to drill down to actually focus more on the child sexual abuse side. So we have now gone in and done the first of our countrywide assessments for ITU in Uganda. Uh, recently completed, where we met with all of those organizations, with civil society, with the police, uh, with the internet industry. And one of the areas we need to do is raise the issue, because part of it is about the sort of education and understanding of, how, of why everybody has a role to play in the fight. And, and I think that just uh, getting people together to understand that alone, on our own, we cannot ha tackle this, but together we can deal with this very effectively. So we've done the assessment in uh, Uganda. We've developed a standard report template to come back and report back on that countrywide assessment. And then the mechanisms that we recommend when we go in are very clear. So if, if a country has, is hosting a lot of content or has a lot of content to report, then they may well need their own hotline. Now, if they need their own hotline, they need to be working with, they can either set up a hotline on their own or they can work directly with InHope, which is the umbrella organization of hotlines internationally. And they will be given all the support and help to do that. We also offer a, a different solution, which is called OXARP, which is an online child sexual abuse reporting portal where people can actually set up their own local homepage and then report directly to us at the IWF. And we will report those, uh, analyze those reports on a, um, a, uh, an individual basis, which is quite a cost-effective solution for many developing countries. Um, the ITU... Um, Partnership, COP partnership really does welcome involvement. And one of the things I wanted to say was that when we engaged with the process, we were welcomed with open arms. You know, actually, they really do want civil society, industry, all of us to work together with, with them. And that's been a very positive process for us and very much something I hope everybody, if you're not engaged with it, that you do engage because it's really uh, a really uh, effective process. And I think it's really starting to uh, bear fruition. So thank you. Okie doke. Uh, good morning. Uh, John Carr. I represented the European NGO Alliance for Child Safety Online. Um, we were uh, involved with the drafting of these guidelines for, from the very beginning, in fact, from the, from the time that the first edition uh, came out. Um, and it's good to see the ITU joining up uh, in a more organized and systematic way with UNICEF and sustaining this initiative because certainly from my travels around the world, and I travel extensively, um, there is a, you know, a great deal of interest in what the UN uh, agencies are doing. People pay attention, uh, particularly in the developing world, to what the UN has to say and do, and obviously two bodies like ITU and UNICEF have got a great deal of weight and prestige in, in many, many different parts of the world. So it's, as in AXO, we're very glad to be part of this process, and uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk very uh, briefly about the Wi-Fi um, component. 
um, of the guidelines. It's, I think, the shortest. I think we can claim to have the shortest uh, in, the, in terms of the number of words, but I hope it's nonetheless both interesting and important for people. The, the experience that we describe and the recommendations that we make had their roots really in what happened within the, uh, within the UK. Um, and briefly, this is the story. So when um, 3G um, first started to emerge, in other words, when more rapid access to the internet via mobile devices started to become possible, um, back in 2003, 2004 in the United Kingdom. Uh, obviously, kids started to go online through their mobile device on a much larger scale than previously. I mean, it was technically possible before then, of course, to go online through your mobile, but the speeds were so slow that in, in reality, uh, not many people did. But three, the arrival of 3G, the arrival of faster connectivity began to change that. With that change, uh, more and more handsets started to become available, which, which uh, as I say, enabled anybody with handset to be able to connect online um, uh, from that mobile device. <clears throat> and the point that we made to the mobile phone industry at the time was that whatever view you take about the theory of kids being supervised by their parents or by their teachers or by the librarian, um, in the old world of fixed um, internet access, that simply ceased to be a practical proposition when kids started to be able to do that through a mobile device. And I'm happy to say that the mobile phone industry accepted that point and accepted also as a consequence that they ought to do more to try to uh, help kids stay safe when there was very little possibility in practice, as I say, of parental supervision or teacher supervision or support from a librarian. And so they began from the 1st of January 2005 by default to block access to all adult content uh, on the internet that might be accessed through the mobile device. Every one of our mobile phone uh, networks does that. Um, in fact, one of them only finally came on board more recently and that's thanks to the pressure from our Prime Minister, David Cameron, who's given a great deal of attention to this general question of uh, child safety on the internet. So now every mobile phone network in the UK by default blocks access to uh, all adult content. Now, now, if you want to get access to adult content through your mobile device, you can. But what you have to do is go through an age verification process. It doesn't take very long. Uh, it's not very difficult to do but it acts as a, as a break, it acts as a way of ensuring that only adults are getting access to that content. So what happened next, of course, was the emergence of Wi-Fi. So uh, all of the handsets started to become available with uh, Wi-Fi connectivity built in, and more and more companies, Starbucks, uh, railway, tra railway stations, hotels, more and more, uh, more, and more uh, places started to make Wi-Fi connectivity available. So what we started to see was kids with the sa exactly the same mobile device, the mobile phone, uh, couldn't get access to adult content through the mobile phone, going into Starbucks or going into a railway station or a, another major retailer and simply switching from the mobile phone network to the Wi-Fi provider and getting access to absolutely anything that was out there. So it completely undermined the investment that the mobile phone companies had made in all of those security measures that they'd taken because it made it a, a very simple and trivial question for them to bypass those connections. So we started speaking to the, the Wi-Fi providers uh, actually before the last election, before the last general election in 2010, but I have to say it was only after the general election in 2010 when our new prime minister made clear that this for him was a very, and for the government, was a very important issue that the Wi-Fi providers finally began to take notice and get involved in serious uh, consideration. So what happens now, uh, um, and this, this was finally made clear about four or five months ago, is all of the major Wi-Fi providers in the United Kingdom by default will block access to pornography and many of them will also um, by default block access to other types of adult content. The difference with Wi-Fi providers however, is that you will not be able to get that lifted. It will be on for everybody. By the way, I should have said, and this is incredibly important, of course, 
is that this will only apply where, they are, where the Wi-Fi service is being provided in a public space where children and young people will normally be expected to be found. So that obviously covers places like Starbucks, uh, cinemas, uh, and so on. So, our, uh, so if, if the Wi-Fi service is being provided in a casino or in a bar uh, or in a strip club or a sex shop or whatever it might be, obviously that, that rule will not be applied because you won't expect to find children or young people in there. Um, so the whole purpose of, of this was around children. It wasn't around censoring content that any adults might want to get in an adult environment. Because, by the way, part of this was not just about what children themselves might access. Imagine you go into Starbucks and you're sitting at a table and the guy next to you uh, has got his tablet or a Wi-Fi device and he brings up uh, all kinds of disagreeable content that, in fact, you can't actually avoid seeing. So it was also not just about access, who might access what, it's who might be exposed to what that was taken into account. So we're suggesting, um, and this, again, it's out for consultation, that uh, Wi-Fi providers outside of the United Kingdom in other parts of the world might consider adopting a similar approach. Um, so it's not as if, you know, that... Uh, absolutely not nothing to do with censorship in the sense that nobody is suggesting that any content that's currently there perfectly legally and lawfully shouldn't continue to be there but it is saying that in public spaces where children and young people are going to be present wi-fi providers need to think about the the consequences of making that type of provision available one last and very quick point um we had one uh, example fairly early on in the united kingdom where one of the wi-fi providers included uh, a website in their blocking uh, list that provided advice to kids about sexual health. Some idiot in the filtering company had decided that this was pornographic. Uh, maybe they were, you know, obviously not very well educated or, or God knows what, what it was, but this was a very bad uh, move. It was drawn to our attention. We, drew, we raised it with, with, the, with the mobile phone network and they changed it within 48 hours. Because a lot of kids, when they go out of the house, they might want to access certain content through the mobile on a Wi-Fi connection that they wouldn't necessarily want to access when they were in their home. So it needs to be done sensitively, it needs to be done properly, uh, but we think it's an important thing for companies to consider. Giacomo, here's the mic. You know your career as a nightclub singer? Yeah. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> I've not changed now. So, um, I represent the European Broadcasting Union. It means uh, the public service broadcaster, not only the, the public service, but mainly public service broadcaster of Europe. And um, we participate to this exercise in conjunction with the World Broadcasting Union, that is the um, association of um, the union of all the unions of broadcasting in the world. Um, we, uh, we are um, involved in this exercise with the ITU since the 31st edition of the guidelines. Um, and we have been participating to this exercise since the beginning. And we are very thankful to the ITU for this initiative that is very much in line with uh, the uh, prerogatives of the public service broadcasting. As you know, uh, each public service broadcaster has um, in his remits a certain number of obligation uh, and uh, that are part of his um, identity. And uh, among this, there is a special attention to be paid to the uh, children uh, to the audience uh, of the young kids and children because of course th there is a specific attention to be given um, what you cannot read in the slide 
is public service, broadcasting services providers. This, uh, this is the part of the guidelines that we are working on. Um, so the, the broadcasting is a, a specific issue because uh, in the past we, uh, we, have, we were in a safe environment, uh, more or less. It was easy to keep safe our environment because uh, you can use um, signals on the screen that could um, advise the, the, the parents about the programs that are difficult to be seen without the parental guidance. Or we simply use the, the time in order to protect children from a certain uh, risk. So you program something after midnight and you are quite sure that uh, this program cannot be accessed by children. But with the online world, with the uh, video on demand system, with the various uh, catch up TV or, or with the various um, providers that work with the broadcasters and make accessible programs at any time of the day, uh, from whoever, this, of course, this, the kind of protection, the system of protection we put in the past are not any more efficient, and we need to move to a different solution. Um, the, as you can see from this um, slides, we try to make a certain number of checklists that uh, we suggest to um, our uh, members. Uh, this is a compilation that has been made, mixing a certain number of uh, recommendations that are made by uh, some broadcasters that are more advanced than others on online world. As you know, the, the, um, uh, the progress within Europe of the different broadcasting um, transfer into the Internet world is very different. There are countries where digitalization is very much already advanced. Uh, and there are others in which the, the um, transfer of the access and the fusion through the Internet uh, is going very slow. So this mainly rules comes from countries like the UK, like Scandinavian countries, uh, where this uh, transfer into the Internet and the online world is very advanced. Um, as you can see, there are a certain number of recommendations. Some of them are general concerning when you go online, a certain number of um, precautions that you need to take. Uh, for instance, um, distinction between what is the broadcasting contents and what, and what are the uh, contents that um, are not coming from the broadcasting. This is very important. Uh, another one is the age verification. Um, that, uh, of course, there we have a problem because not all over Europe we have the same rules, and uh, when you transfer this to a global level, it is even more complicated. Um, and then there are a certain a number of recommendations um, how uh, treat uh, this kind, this specific public and this specific audience having a certain number of um, attention. Um, for instance, listen, respect children at all times. Uh, don't patronize them. This is very important because one of the rules that we have uh, uh, suggesting to our members is that, uh, for instance, there is um, need for um, when you have um, interactive online services like chat or um, possibility to exchange interactively between the audience, the young audience and the online world, that this, the, the online has to be always uh, with the present in presence of a um, uh, webmaster that could intervene and eventually remove or uh, ban um, uh, inappropriate um, behaviors that of course could happen when there is a live interaction and uh, there are in fact a certain number of um, chats where the children could be involved that are closed when uh, they are not accessible when there is no webmaster present in uh, online so I don't go in detail for all, all, all of these rules, but these are some suggestions that we give to our members. Of course, the, for some of them, this doesn't mean nothing because they are not yet at this stage uh, of the online uh, consumption, of the online transfer of their programs and of their services. But um, this could be seen as a, a model that could be used as as much as the progress of the digitalization and the transfer into the online world is progressing.
Good morning, everyone, and thanks for being here. And uh, I would also like to commend the ITU and UNICEF for taking on this project and think it's uh, very important to get this work out. Uh, I'm Kim Sanchez. I'm with Microsoft and a particular organization called Trustworthy Computing. And my team focuses on education and awareness efforts to help all of our consumers worldwide understand the risks that are out there and what they can do to stay safer online. So I've been asked to talk about the application portion of the checklist, and the title of it is Content Providers, Online Retailers, and App Developers. And I'll just go through kind of the high-level points that we're trying to make here and why. So there was an article I was just looking up. Uh, in 2010, Wired Magazine wrote the headline, the web is dead, long live the internet. And what the point they were making in that piece was about, it's all about apps. You can live all day on all of your devices just using apps. You don't necessarily have to go on to the internet, to, to the web, to, uh, to, to, to find what you're looking for. There's an app for weather. There's an app for checking your time zones and currency exchange for those of us who travel. And Facebook is an app and Instagram is an app coming soon to Windows Phone. Um, so there is really an app for everything. And the concept that we're looking at here with the guidelines is um, what should developers be thinking about as they provide these apps? I think a lot of app developers, some of them are very big companies. Some of them are very small, kind of what we would call mom and pop shops. So just you know, a couple people developing these applications. And they're not necessarily thinking about privacy or safety or security as they build these uh, applications. And what we want to get ahead of is um, it, bad things being harbored on these applications. And what we also are concerned about is, uh, at least in the US, the Congress has been looking at Apple and the iPhone and tracking and very, very much privacy specific. They're going to go after the big guys first, but it won't be long before the big guys are, are, are um, being made an example of, and then the smaller developers will have to follow suit around some of these things. So I'm just going to talk about high level what we want to accomplish and some of the things that are um, in the checklist. So content providers, we're asking them if they can help identify, prevent, and mitigate adverse impacts of ICT by taking the following actions. And we want them to think about balance. So we know that the internet is a fantastic place for all of us to be. It's just woven into the fabric of our lives. We, we can't get away from it, nor should we. Um, but there is something called balance. And it's good to be outside every once in a while and kick your kids out and, and even for us to take a break from whatever device we're using. So kind of getting that concept across. Most importantly, we're asking developers to think about a process for handling child sexual abuse images and that they collaborate within their organizations and certainly with law enforcement when it comes to illegal content being reported and discover, discovered on their applications. Um, we would like processes and tools in place to help identify those images um, when, they, when they are found and then to certainly have a removal and block process to um, stop the proliferation of those images. We also want to make sure that um, developers are working within the organization and, and they're passing on the illegal content to the hotlines and um, to law enforcement for criminal investigation. Then we get to the notion of developing a safer and age-appropriate online environment. Excuse me. In the gaming world, we have something in the US called the ESRB, the Entertainment Software Ratings Board, PEGI in the, in the um, EU. And of course, when we go to movies, there's a rating for the movies, if it's PG, 13, R, you know, that type of thing. And we're, we're kind of thinking about that in the app space. I know that ESRB, and I, I believe Peggy is probably looking into this, but we want to make sure that we're very clear and we have an external label describing the type of content that the app, um, who the app is suitable for, especially if it's children, that you can expect if it is for kids, then you will not have some of the more explicit content um, that's available. 
We'd like app developers to ensure transparency in terms of pricing their services and information that's collected about your users. So this really goes to complying with the relevant laws uh, concerning the privacy of minors. And in the U.S., again, we've got COPPA, which is the Child Online Privacy Protection Act, really born out of trying to keep advertising um, from kids many, many years ago. And I know that COPPA's kind of become the de facto law, if you will, in, in most parts of the world, in which it means anyone under 13 can't use a lot of these sites or they have to get parental uh, permission to, to go online and to certain, uh, to certain sites. So we want to make sure where possible we can adopt age-appropriate verification methods to prevent children from accessing age-sensitive content sites or interactive services such as chat rooms and where risks of inappropriate contact and conduct may exist. Okay, there's a lot of detail in here, uh, so I encourage you to, to go check it out. You don't want me to read all of this, I, trust me. Um, and then, and most importantly, that notion of education and, and guidance and awareness. We had a session yesterday talking to youth. One of the best things that I think came out of there was a, a young woman said, parents just need to be curious about what their kids are doing online, and I just I couldn't agree with that more. You know, you ask somebody, you say, oh, do your kids game? Well, what games do they play? Oh, I don't know. Or they say, oh, those violent things. You know, they're not, they're not necessarily engaged with their kids. And I think it's a huge missed opportunity to really understand what's going on. So we, we do want parents to be curious and be involved in not just what their kids are gaming, but what they're doing, who they're interacting with online, the devices and services they're using. I think that the, keeping those conversations open uh, is very important. So there's some language in here about that as well. And lastly, promoting digital technology as a mode to further posit positive to further positive civic engagement. So making sure that we offer a lot of uh, rich and compelling content for uh, age-appropriate kids. So for younger kids, they're going to be more on the entertainment side. But as kids get older, we need to think about content that's not just going to be about entertainment because that's not all there is out there and what's going to challenge them. And maybe think about starting a business or standing up for something they believe in in a cause. It's been so fun talking to some of the youth here, particularly the, the kids from the Netherlands. And there was a 17-year-old, and he's got two or three businesses that he's working on, and he's got venture capital money. And I'm like, what, wow. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's so impressive, but it's really cool. And so I think it's, it's that concept of making sure that we're not, um, that we're, we're educating about the risks that are out there, but we're also promoting um, the, the Internet and the apps as a way to really, you know, change the world. Why not? So that's it. Thank you. Hello. Is it okay if I stay here? Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I do apologize for joining you late. I was presenting in another session at the same time. Uh, but happy to be here. I missed the first bit where I probably explained the, the whole concept of the guideline. And uh, my name is Anjan Bose. I'm from ECPAT International. Uh, we are one of the ITU COP members uh, from the very beginning, I can say. Uh, even though we were not um, part of the first edition um, of this guideline, we felt um, that there was a scope for us to engage in the process, and thank you for op offering that opportunity to us. Um, I have to admit, um, the section that I'm going to present the checklist uh, is the user-generated content, um, social networks, and so on, and that doesn't fall within the ambit of what the work we do directly, because um, I mean, by no means, um, coming from a social network or uh, a content provider. Uh, but having said that, um, I did work uh, closely uh, in terms of policies and guidelines and helping um, understand the different ways in which uh, a particular social network was being used, a very, very popular and for probably one of the biggest uh, social networks, so you can guess who I'm referring to. Um, and uh, what they kindly uh, did was to share with us um, a set of guidelines and internal uh, guidelines and policy that they had developed in, term, in, in order to keep um, their uh, platform safe. And um, that was the principles 
um, taken from that guideline was um, held, you know introduced uh, within this and incorporated within these guidelines with the formatting and text or uh, you know the uh, with the kind work of UNICEF and ITU um, our role was more to provide feedback and to strengthen it and then to you know provide more um, you know, guide, guiding directions rather than creating the whole body of text. And some of the thing that you see in the content is also taken from open source uh, that's being used by uh, other social networks. So that's just the background, you know, how, how our interaction with this process uh, started and developed. Um, I think um, Dominic and Kim had already alluded to um, some of the framework, some of the structures, and I'm sure Aya had probably, while well, she introduced, discussed the basic fundamental principles that uh, will guide all these uh, sectors. Um, and I think there's a lot of commonality between uh, what Kim said in terms of, um, you know, um, and Dominic said in terms of uh, child sexual abuse content. Uh, what, what defines, uh, what, what are the type of content uh, that needs to be defined, how it is defined, uh, what needs to be done when those are detected, uh, who reports, uh, how can the reporting mechanisms be enhanced. So these are some of the things that um, are common uh, across the board. Um, in terms of social networks, you know it's a challenge uh, because, and the user-generated content because content gets generated on the fly every now and then. And how do you prove and vet what is legal unless somebody looks at it. Uh, there is no automatic detection tools apart from uh, the known child abuse materials. You know, we can use photo DNA, for example, to identify already detected images. But if I am to produce a new image now and to upload it onto the network and make it public, who stops me from doing that? So the deterrence, you know, the terms of condition um, play a very important part, we think, and uh, that's also incorporated. What is acceptable, what is not acceptable, needs to be very clearly defined and uh, made more visible because in most cases, you just check a box while you are subscribing. You don't even necessarily follow what's written there. So it's very important that some of the pragmatic stuff are made more visible, uh, made more, you know, kind of usable. Um, in terms of the social networks, um, you know, we also... One of the important element is the privacy, uh, the default setting for minors when they log in, um, the friends list, um, who can access the nesting of the friends. If you are a friend of a group of people, are you automatically linked to all the friends they have? So these are some of the considerations. I don't want to get into the details of you know, what is. You can go through the uh, document and have your comments. But fundamentally, uh, what we... So we prescribed or we suggested that all social networks and uh, user-generated content provide, you know, platforms that pr allows users to generate their own content and interact with others should have certain basic um, structures. So one is uh, clear policies regarding what to do with um, um, illegal content, what comprises illegal content, and what are the procedures for handling them to the law enforcement, taking them down. I think some, all of these matches very clearly with what GSMA has in place, what the app developers should know in terms of creating, um, you know, from the very onset uh, regarding security and safety of the users. Um, the other thing, uh, the technology solutions are already introduced by one of the biggest um, social networks, as we mentioned before, Photo DNA. Um, we should use technology solutions as much as possible by as many, I, I mean, ideally all social network providers, user-generated content providers should have a system of using technology to detect because, um, you know, the time it takes to, uh, to detect content and report content can be, um, you know, long enough for the, uh, is Jutta, you want to say something? So I saw your hands being raised, sorry. Um, and um, community intelligence is another section, and I, I, don't, I, I will not repeat the education bit because that's integral to it. And, and the one thing that I want to say about the education bit is that these platforms are used globally. And uh, the language issue 
is very important. How these are distributed to the population is very important. You may develop something because you are uh, you know, within a given country and most of these platforms come from, I would have to say it's from the West, from US. Uh, doesn't necessarily the, uh, the language and the way the guidance are developed translate very well and understood very well uh, in a different cultural context. So it may need to be adapted into the cultural context and you need to have measures to distribute the information uh, in the best way possible uh, so that it's understood by the users. Um, so that's um, the kind of uh, framework uh, that we have and I think there's a lot of common between you know, the different industry partners. Uh, the challenge here is the randomness, the rapidness and um, the, you know, how the content is pr pr produced. And uh, so we need to have community intelligence to flag it and report it and make it as quick as possible so that the appropriate actions can be taken. I think those were the key messages that we tried to bring. Apart from you know, the age verification systems, um, I, I mean, this had been already mentioned. Um, so I hope um, you know, once we have a public consultation open, we can have more robust um, feedback and discussions because it's an ongoing process. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm Jangi from Bangladesh. I'm especially on working on Bangladesh uh, Network Operator Group, also a member of Bangladesh Cyber Security Response Team. So based on this conversation, I have um, created a couple of questions in here. The first question is, it is, in developed countries, a couple of policy is all, already implemented and it's working fine, but in developing countries' views, as like of our country's view, it is very challenges to implement those developed countries' policy in our country. So how can we bridge them by considering the global and local policy? The first issue. And second issue, how can we get help to build awareness to build up local content from ITO or UNICEF as like that? And th as the third question, my, as a security response team from Bangladesh, while I try to get uh, engaged with content providers like Google, Microsoft, or whatever you find, give me information. Uh, this, who is this guy? Who is this? This who we make to inform our government because government pressure us. We cannot get proper response on that time. So how, how can we resolve this? I need uh, your views or suggestion from developing countries how to resolve this type of question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. My name's uh, Alan Cairns. I'm a member of the uh, UK Parliament. Um, thank you for the presentations at the outset, which I found uh, extremely helpful and uh, useful, some of the people I'm, I'm familiar with. Um, I think that we have a position whereby uh, technolog technological solutions will be able to provide a lot of the answers in terms of protecting children. That's where parents show sufficient interest in wanting to, in wanting to do that although that we have a difficult situation where children understand more than the parents. And therefore, the way in which uh, technological measures are developed is quite important in order to allow and help and educate and inform parents in, in order to take those uh, educated um, and informed uh, decisions. So therefore, I think a lot of responsibility falls to the technological companies, to the software developers, the application developers, and so on, in or, and the, the ISPs in order to come up with easy filtering uh, models uh, that can be used effectively. So is there, is there a genuine will from the experiences panel? Is there a genuine will by those companies to come up with much easier, more comprehensive filtering systems? And I know filters aren't all the answers, but they can certainly be a large part uh, of the answer. Uh, a specific question to John Carr on the Wi-Fi uh, arrangements. Uh, what recommendations are there in relation to places where there are grey areas? Because I, I appreciate it's not black and white. Hotels are obvious. Um, is, the, is a private room in a hotel, is that a private space? Or is that a public space? Bearing in mind it uses the uh, same uh, network. And secondly, relating to public service broadcasters, in the UK we have the benefit of the BBC. I think they are, can be quite fantastic in terms of communicating things effectively. And if I go back to the first point that I made where parents very often don't understand the risks, 
um, and the BBC could be, or a public service broadcaster in any nation, could be the trusted source of advice and can also use their programmes in terms of communicating uh, uh, the risks to parents through partly through their drama programmes, partly through documentaries, but partly through um, being having a, uh, website portals which will simply explain what the risks are and how the filtering settings or th can be adjusted in order to reflect their own different cultural uh, demands and needs. Thanks very much. Yeah, my name is Jutta Koll. I'm from the Di Digital Opportunities Foundation from Germany. And uh, just in reply to the question that was put on, um, we are running the so-called um, SIP benchmark, which is a pen benchmark of parental controls. And referring to the question of filtering, we, we just have to say that the effectiveness is really, at this point of time, not high enough. I would not say it's low, but it's still not high enough. So... Uh, filtering can only be part of the solution, I would say. But uh, also referring to what John Carr uh, had said, uh, we really appre appreciate this approach of having safety built in, into the devices as well into the services. We call that the safety by design approach. It's laid down in this brochure that I would like to refer your attention to. But also, I have a question to John Carr, because, John, you mentioned that situation maybe in Starbucks, where someone is sitting, having porn on their own device, and children sitting beneath. I would not say that this is a technical question. That should go to ethical and moral values, and if you know that a children is sitting beneath you, then you just should shut down your computer and don't look at porn, I would say, in that situation. But maybe you have another answer. Thank you. So uh, we are running out of time. So we have uh, three questions. So maybe uh, we can uh, first take those and uh, probably handle the others offline. So uh, John, would you like to? Because yeah. a lot of the questions were posed to you. Okay, so there were two questions directed at me. The first question was <clears throat> about people who sit in public places looking at porn when there are children nearby. Obviously, in Germany, this never happens. Um, sadly, in the United Kingdom, and this may come as a shock to you, uh, occasionally it does. Uh, and, in, and in the United States, uh, there have been cases where guys have actually been arrested in burger bars looking at child pornography or child abuse images on the on their website. Now, you know, I wish the world wasn't the way it is. Unfortunately, it is the way it is. Uh, you would expect that grown-ups would know how to behave, that they'd have... We have an expression in English, the brass neck, yeah? You, you would hope they wouldn't have the brass neck to sit in a public place, particularly where there are kids there. If it's a casino or a bar, different matter. But where there are kids around, you would hope and expect people to know how to behave. But places like Starbucks and so on, they provide the facility. They absolute, They market to children. They market to young people. McDonald's, by the way, McDonald's is exemplary. From the word go, McDonald's had filtering installed, so it could never happen in the UK in a McDonald's place. What was interesting, by the way, is the way, the way in which companies like McDonald's and Starbucks have different policies in different countries. In Starbucks and McDonald's in the United Kingdom, uh, they, they both apply filters to block porn. They do not, neither company does that in the United States, and in fact, neither company does it in most other countries where they operate. So it's kind of puzzling to me, what is it about British kids uh, that is so special or particular that they need protection, and what is it about American kids that means they don't? Uh, it does seem rather odd. On the Alan Cairns' point, uh, there are gray areas. The view, hotels is the most obvious one. The view that we took was that if it's a public space or a reception room or a meeting room, that would be a public space. If it's a bedroom that people are renting, that's a private space and it's up to the hotel to make a decision. But actually, you raised a very good point that I ought to have referred to in my uh, remarks earlier. We have said that a publicly trusted, well-known body 
ought to be involved in setting transparent standards across the piece. And in the case of the United Kingdom, we have a body called the British, the British Board of Film Classification that, that does ratings for cinema uh, and so on, cinemas and so on. It does the 18, 15 RPG and stuff like that. Our suggestion was that the BBFC could have a role to play in setting transparent standards. At the moment, it's being done by companies like Symantec and McAfee and Kaspersky. And actually, you know, I don't really have a problem with that either, as long as it's transparent and as long as there is an appeals mechanism. But in a way, I think it probably would be better for everybody if there was a publicly accountable or a publicly recognized body that had some level of engagement in setting standards. Can I? Go ahead. Um, my name is Mohammed. I'm from Disk Foundation India. I'm from a very heterogeneous situation in India. Uh, I have a seven-year-old son. He is asking for a Facebook account. I said, "No, you cannot have a Facebook account because you need to have a 13-year." So that all my classmates are having Facebook account. Okay. So you're talking about age verification system. I mean. And I have to now give to my son the Facebook account, add me as a friend into that. Otherwise, he will go and take it without me knowing. The problem is we talk about the age verification system from a European and American perspective. When you come to an Asian perspective, that doesn't work. In India, especially with them also from India, they understand, many people understand that. They just lie, okay, I am 18 year, 19 year, and in fact, they are six years old. The, a perfect, effective age verification system have to be discussed. That was number one. Number two, as uh, John Carr was saying, the Wi-Fi and the, uh, frankly speaking, pe people are going for alternative methods of distributing contents. VPN, torrents, uh, all those things, uh, apps basically, the, the mobile apps, where the, you, will, you will not have no control on that. So we have to think in that uh, how are we going to stop or block those type of uh, distribution of the contents? It's a very big problem. I've, I'm not talking about a particular industry, but it's a mobile application. If you have an application and uh, we have no understanding what data is pushing through that particular tunnel if it is a VPN connectivity. And we are facing a problem. I'm coming from United Arab Emirates. I'm working there as a, as a business intelligence analyst. United Arab Emirates is quite good in terms of blocking and uh, taking care of it. But most of the children having VPN account, free VPNs, one dollar you get two GB, three GB VPN access. And the moment they're connected, government don't, don't have any control, ISP don't have any control, so they are doing all these things. So we have to think, uh, come out from Europe and an American perspective and come to our uh, realistic problem, what we are facing, and we have to think about a solution in that regard. Thank you very much. Uh, I completely agree with the, the burden of what you were saying there. The fact is some things are harder to do than others. Uh, that's no, uh, and things like VPNs and uh, encryption and so on uh, are perhaps at the hardest end. But that's no reason not to do what you can at the easier end. Um, I'm amazed to hear that every child in the United Arab Emirates got a VPN. That shows a degree of sophistication and of... Uh, that's certainly not copied in the United Kingdom. Uh, I'm not sure what we can do about VPNs and torrents and encryption and things like that. Uh, we'll, we may have to confront those types of issues. Uh, people are thinking about it, but there's a lot of other stuff we can do ahead of that, which will reach out to a very large number of kids that I think we ought to be doing. I'll, I'll just add on to that and then address a little bit of what the, um, the UK um, MP talked about as well. But I, I think it goes to the notion that education awareness is very important. You know, kids are going to be a step ahead of their parents when it comes to technology that's around the globe. But as we always say, adults have wisdom. They have life experiences to offer. They may not know how to do this or that in, with a particular service or device, but they can say, hmm, that doesn't feel right. Let's talk about that. Or, you know, let's, let's see if this offer is coming to you. you know, it sounds a little too good to be true. It probably is. It's those kinds of experiences that adults should be talking to their kids about. Um, and, but I think education awareness is, is key. You're not going to be able to stop the kids who want to go and do the bad things, but hopefully you're giving them the, um, 
the, the literacy to think about what they're doing. Uh, just uh, to answer the uh, question from the gentleman from uh, Bangladesh, I'll give it to uh, Aya. Thank you. Yes, uh, we, we fully appreciate the, um, the challenges uh, in, in, um, in, in countries uh, where maybe the kind of corporate responsibility frameworks uh, and, and the, the supporting legislation or regulation is, is not fully in place and, and there may be issues with law enforcement sometimes. In, in terms of specifically looking, looking at Bangladesh, um, um, and, and you know, we do this uh, in many countries uh, around the world, um, so I mentioned in the beginning that, um, that one core uh, framework that uh, our team within UNICEF is, um, is using as a tool is the children's rights and business principles, which, which are um, a kind of a, let's call it a business responsibility framework, specifically looking at children's, um, children's rights. Um, and, and it is fully fully um, uh, built upon international standards. What we've done uh, uh, with this framework, uh, which was uh, launched last year, is uh, that we've, um, in many countries around the world, in actually over 30 countries, we've launched uh, initiatives around this framework, inviting uh, the private sector and the governments uh, to work together uh, on both uh, sort of uh, issues related to children's rights in general, but also industry-specific issues. And it so happens that we've done it in Bangladesh <laughs> as well. So uh, I would I would strongly suggest uh, to um, to contact our our office there. And uh, so they have uh, I don't know what frequency uh, those uh, workshops are taking place, but there's been several already where the the businesses um, uh, as well as other stakeholders have met uh, to discuss the the framework of policy development uh, for corporate uh, responsibility as well as the due diligence processes and, and how to actually incorporate this. And I know that we've had some discussions. There's some kind of an I, ICT um, industry organization, or, so they've been also involved and invited into, into the discussions. And anybody coming from other countries, um, I mean, we, we do have these platforms in place in many countries. In India, for instance, we work with the government here in Indonesia. I've just spent last week in Jakarta, uh, where we also collaborate with the government on a child-friendly companies initiative and work with the chambers of commerce in, in these areas. So, so it's not ICT industry specific, but it supports the kind of implementation of responsible business frameworks um, with special consideration for child rights. Thank you. Thank you. I think we are almost out of time. There's one gentleman here, and Giacomo wanted to respond uh, to, but I think we'll have to wrap it up quickly before we are evicted from here. Okay. Uh, hi. My name is uh, Eric Hartanto. Uh, I'm from uh, one of the internet company in Indonesia, actually. And uh, I'm working together with the, the Indonesian government to provide internet uh, to all the rural areas. Right now, as you can see, um, the the users is mostly actually children. So that's why I feel responsible, uh, you know, for the content itself. But um, I don't have fully control of the content because it is working. Uh, we are working together with the Indonesian government, and of course. Um, uh, you know, uh, we provide the infrastructure, and the government is actually control the the content itself. But I'm quite worried because uh, uh, sometimes uh, it is, uh, you know, just like this gentleman from uh, India, Mr. Muhammad said. Uh, sometimes the children are very very smart. Uh, we created the con um, a content filtering called Insan. Uh, it's um, uh, it's in Indonesian, but uh, it stands for uh, Internet. Uh, healthy internet and safe internet. It's something like that. But of course, we cannot be compared to, uh, you know, all the uh, pornography that is in, in the website, which is, you know, growing exponentially each day. So uh, in terms, uh, we already have uh, internet deployed into the rural areas, and which is the users are children. And I'm so worried. That's why I, I would like to know more uh, about this program and how can, um, you know, I'm reaching out to the panelists here to help us, you know. Uh, it's very good that you already have, uh, you know, um, working together with the Indonesian government and hopefully it can be implemented. And uh, I'm, I'm open to any other suggestion that we can use uh, or we can, you know, we can work out uh, with the Indonesia, even with the Indonesian government because as the partner of the government, I can also suggest to them 
on uh, how we are going to do things. I think that's all for me. Thank you very much. I, I think we, we have to finish here, but I'd just like to say that we actually one of the initiatives with the Indonesian government that we're just completing is a study about um, the use of Internet by, by children. <laughs> so it is a partnership initiative, which I, we're looking to get the results uh, out any time now. So maybe that is, is um, in, in the discussions as well is, is going to be some guiding materials, but we can have a discussion offline. Uh, thank you. Yeah, um, just to answer to the question about the, your question about the role of public service broadcaster, <clears throat> we know, and this is part of the, the responsibility that we feel, that we know that many parents rely on public service broadcasting as a substitute for the family control. So the program, because they expect that the program that we show and also now the online offer of services that uh, the public service broadcaster provide provide the same guarantees and uh, control that, that there was in the past. This is the difficulty of the exercise. We are doing our best to do so. And then sometimes this means that we have also to restrict, for instance, access to chat when there is nobody that, uh, no webmaster that could control the chat. Um, you also mentioned another point about creating and raising awareness. Of course, all public service brokers are providing uh, parental uh, suggestions on how to deal with the children on the internet, uh, but uh, as you know, most of the parents they don't have the time to go through that, so you have to replace them as much as possible in your activity. But uh, another raise another level of awareness is to talk of that in the news, and uh, many of our members they do regularly. But another one is also to talk in the fiction, and um, in the sense, for instance, last year. Uh, Rai, that I know very well because it, I'm Italian, uh, produced uh, a fiction exactly about um, a young girl that uh, started to to chat and to expose herself uh, through um, the internet and then got trapped into a, a big problem. And this created a, a large debate in the country. And I think that this kind of things need to be uh, made uh, more frequent in order to create and raise awareness. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think it's uh, time to um, finish uh, this session. Thank you so much for your input and feedback. And just to remind you, uh, the the site uh, where where the um, where the documents are are now posted is uh, is up on the slide. It's a bit of a complex. <laughs> complex uh, URL for the time being, but uh, we will be adding the links to both the ITU COPPA site and to the UNICEF uh, CSR site. So for the ITU COP site, it's itu.int forward slash COP, C-O-P, and for UNICEF, it's uh, unicef.org forward slash CSR. So thank you so much and looking forward to um, lots of input. Thank you.